reassuring enough, except the 1918 flu was the most dangerous. It killed 50 million people, and that's because it spread further and faster than the others, which is the big fear about today's epidemic, because it's spreading at the same rate as the 1918 flu strain. OK, let's talk now to Tom Frieden, who used to be head of the Centers for Disease Control here in the United States. Uh, Mr. Frieden, thanks very much for joining us. Can you just outline for us, because I think there is really a lot of confusion everywhere around the world, what you see as the best case scenario with this coronavirus and what you see as the worst case scenario? Well, we don't yet know how infectious, how infectious it is and how deadly it is. So in the best case scenario, it's not that infectious and it's not that deadly. In that scenario, we would see um, clusters or outbreaks that could be stopped after weeks or months and then it would go away. We don't think that's likely anymore because we're seeing this continue to spread in many places, spreading explosively in different situations in a church, in a shop, in healthcare settings. So this looks pretty infectious. Uh, how far and wide it will spread, only time will tell. But unfortunately, we seem to be in the calm before the storm in most places of the world. In terms of how fatal it is, how deadly it is, it is, as you said, less deadly than SARS, but we don't know how much less deadly. We're seeing um, case fatality rates, the proportion of people who die from it, of less than 1% in parts of China outside of Hubei province. But even 1% is quite high if you end up with something that spreads to millions or hundreds of millions of people. So it's too soon to say how bad it will be. It's not too soon to prepare for the uh, worst case scenarios because by doing that, mm. we can reduce the impact it will have. So th there's been some hope that this virus a flu type virus by the spring when the weather gets warmer would recede or, or perhaps disappear but the 1918 flu there was the spring outbreak then it kind of died away in the summer and then it re-emerged just as deadly in the autumn of 1918 and into the winter do we when will we know whether this is a virus that's just going to go away when the warmer weather kicks in we'll know when it happens or doesn't happen. There is no way to predict with confidence what is going to happen in terms of the weather with this virus. Um, there are other coronavirus strains that have a winter peak and a summer peak. With influenza, we know that in tropical climates, it continues all year long. It's not just a winter virus. But this is unprecedented. We have never had a newly emerging respiratory virus spreading around the world. We continue to learn more every day and sometimes every hour. And the more we learn, the more we know, the more we can do to protect people by encouraging, encouraging people to wash their hands, cover their coughs, not go out if they're sick, by preparing the healthcare system to surge safely to care for people, and by getting governments to invest in a big way, because we're either going to pay now or pay a lot more later in lives and in money. But Mr. Frieden, uh, when I listen to the, the, the British Health Secretary, you, you get a sense of how difficult every government actually is finding it um, in, in how to advise people in their own countries. I mean, overreaction, as he said yesterday, has its costs. It has a, a cost on livelihoods. It has a cost to the economy. But then you look at the example of China, where these extreme measures appear to be working. They're working so far. But what's going to happen when China releases its clampdown on uh, people staying at home. There are hundreds of millions of people who have stayed at home for the last month. You can't continue that forever. That still has value because it buys time. It buys time to prepare healthcare systems, to invest in new programs, to train people, to educate the public. But that's only useful if you use the time you're buying to prepare more. And that's why I think it's so important that we invest in preparedness now, not only things that we can do today, but also in the U.S., there's a supplemental budget appropriation. That's very close to important to watch. Globally, we really need to think about why we're so underprepared. It is inevitable that this will be a pandemic and that there will be future epidemics and pandemics. What's not inevitable is that we continue to be so underprepared.
Okay, Tom Frieden, thank you so much for joining us. You know, to that question you were just asking, Tom, about what happens in the summer, what will be interesting to watch is that case that they have in Brazil because they're subtropical, it's mm. summer, it's hot, and the, the Brazilian Health Secretary was saying yesterday, well, we'll see how it copes with these sort of temperatures because we've not seen that in, in many of the other countries where it's, it's taken yeah. hold. And, and also to that point about whether people are prepared, are people not just in terms of washing their hands, but are people mentally prepared mm. to be stuck in quarantine? I mean, if you're stuck, we don't really know what it means a family, say you've got you know, your two kids and you and your wife and you're stuck in quarantine. Are the kids going to have to be in one room? How do you get them food? Who looks after them yeah. for two weeks? I don't think people are really aware of what it's going to mean for them.